is Rabbi Moshe Otero with the Ways of Israel. And here we are Thursday already. We begin the celebration of Lagba Omer this evening. And many uh, communities are planning different events, so it's a great opportunity to take advantage. But Lagba Omer is a very fascinating, um, I could say, celebration in which we celebrate the reprieve, as it were, of the plagues. Uh, we, we read and we learn by the rabbis that basically uh, 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva uh, received a plague. And of course the plague had to do with the death, the plague of death. That was a slaughtering of the disciples. And that slaughtering, as it were, by the Roman Empire, by the Romans, the reprieve stopped just about now and during the time of Lagba Omer. But the question was asked is why the whole thing got started in the first place? Why why this su sudden plague broke out among the disciples of one of the most learned rabbis of our time, or of their time, as it were, the first century? I mean, this is something... Lashon Hara had a way in destroying the unity of the community of Jews. Yes, my friends, this is a small little thing called the tongue. It started a whole fire that destroyed. See, not Hinnom was the main cause for this fire that destroyed the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiba. They were basically tearing each other apart. And these were talking about same students, same disciples of the same teachers, bite, backbiting, speaking evil, destroying each other, with their mouth and all of a sudden the very enemies opened up and began to kill them and destroy them and of course we know how Rabbi Akiba also ended up being filleted to death by the hands of the Romans and we ask ourselves even today as we're going through this pandemic if there's any correlation breaking out like it did in the first century and in every century, there is a plague that destroys humanity. But in particular, you know, we've had a whole entire amount of death by Jews, by this pandemic, by natural diseases or complications that involved even big, giant Torah scholars uh, being removed off of the face of this earth. We have to ask ourselves, devours, and this fire has devoured many great Torah giants. I mean, we've lost a lot of people during this whole entire period of time. Um, and people that are dear to us, very beloved, incredible minds that we just are astonished by the fact that they're no longer with us. The same impact took place over 2,000 years ago with these students of Rabbi Akiva. And we wonder and we ask ourselves, what happened that such a plague consumed them to such an extent they are no longer here physically in this world? What is it to learn? We need to learn not to criticize, not to demean, not to pontificate over them uh, in such a way that we become guilty of the same sin. There's another aspect of this because, as you know, this is a semi-period time of mourning and many have the customs on the Lugaba Omer and beyond to begin shaving or closing or doing upshurnish, which is the custom of cutting the, the child's hair at the age of two. And there are so many beautiful lessons that we can learn during this celebration of Lugba Omer, including the idea that we are like trees in the field and just like a tree in the field that normally does not get to be eaten according to Jewish law biblical law we also are not allowed to partake of the new fruits until after three years and in the same way um, we have the same applications with the hair I remember when I did the appearance of my son uh, David Joseph how was that celebration he had his, his hair so long all the way down and it was a wonderful celebration and then after that after that we took him to school wrapped up in in his talit or in the talit 
people are supposed to make sure that he would start being educated in the ways of, of Hashem. This is the way we, we start the childhood of, of, of a Jewish boy. How much more so we should start relearning the importance of the, of the, of the, of the sincerity and of the, the purity of a child. And there's so many different applications to this that we need to watch the way we treat each other. You know, I was watching a video by Yanuka, who he speaks about the evils of speaking, of speaking against a, a Torah scholar, a fellow Jew, anyone. Of course, the whole thing started with, with, a, uh, with the, a, a group that thinks that everybody is bad. And when a person has an evil eye, have a bad eye, their whole entire systems of thought is also bad. See, when you're always looking for the devil, you see devils in everything. Whenever a person is looking for evil, they see evil in everything. And it's time for us to, to force ourselves to change the way we look at things. Instead of seeing always the bad in others, begin to see the good. There is always bad in everything that we're surrounded with. Because unfortunately, there is good and bad within us. It's called the Yitzhahara and the Yitzhatov. Whether you agree or accept it or not, the fact is that we are constantly battling ourselves over what we decide to accept as the truth. And when you look at a person with a negative light, your whole entire life is negativity. And that destroys, my friends, that destroys. So this guy, Yanuka, who a group of people, not of our faith, starting accusing him to being the Antichrist. And a whole bunch of stuff started happening all surrounding him because, you know, the guy is a very humble guy, a very learned guy, a, very, a guy when you listen to what he's teaching is Torah. And he was the focus of the attacks by the missionaries and the Christians and by other groups who have no idea what Torah is all about, what scripture is all about. And unfortunately, this, this young man out of Israel, who, like I said, very, very, I sat down to listen to a lot of his teachings, incredible, profound. And I was joking with a good friend of mine, Yochanan, from Punto Breslev, and I said, to, I said to him, wouldn't it be funny that they picked on the guy who may happen to be the Mashiach? Now, don't go by and start saying, oh, I said he was the Mashiach. I said, but, you know, how ironic that in every generation there could be a person who is of such a quality of character, such a humbleness, that he brings and draws people to God just by his manner. You know, we should imitate such characters, such persons in, in Judaism. We should imitate that, that innocence and that purity and that love of honest Torah in such a way like this young man. This young man has an incredible mind. I was very impressed, as you can tell. Very impressive his ability to, to to cite Torah by memory, be able to cite the, the Navim by memory, the, uh, even cite the uh, the Talmud. I mean, give you passages, pasuk, verses, everything, just by memory. If you see him when he he gives his lecture, he has no no notes on there. Many of the rabbis, you know, many of us, what we do is we have our notes or our points that we're going to talk about, or we have in our head at least a an outline. This guy with no outline. He just quotes, boom, like it was a flow. A constant flow of knowledge, of understanding, and of application. When you guys have a chance, take a look at his channel. Incredible. They call him Yanuka. And he's a very pious... Uh, apparently he came from, the Ye from Yemen, descendant, Sephardic descendant as well, but he happens to be a Haredi. Um, incredible, incredible lessons. You just stay there just amazed by the, the, the profundity of his thing. And yet, at the same time, these were the type of levels of, of rabbis and disciples of the time of Rabbi Akiva. And yet, among themselves, they were destroying each other by, the, by their mouth. Oh, this one's not this. That one's not that. This one has this problem. This guy, I'm, I'm the favorite one. And we're going to find that what destroys people and unity are is that same thing lush and hara the the question of putting doubt in everything you do as a matter of fact the idea of putting doubt into something has an acronym of amalek when you doubt something to such an extent that you're putting everything and everyone to doubt 
you are really working on behalf of the Yetzirah, of the evil inclination. And my friends, we have gone through over a half a million deaths in this country. Not to count or separate from that half a million death to count all the Jews that died during this pandemic. I'm, I, I, I'm sure if someone would tabulate this, it would probably be close to the same 24,000 or more Jews who have died during this pandemic. And I, I, would, I would be afraid to even say it was, it's been, you know, close to even a million worldwide. I don't know. I don't know statistics, so I'm not going to venture to say the numbers are there. But, but there's a lot of Jews. I mean, New York is somewhat empty. A lot of Jews in New York really got, got hit. Even a good friend of mine who I love dearly, who now I think is in Colombia, I think, uh, also got hit with the COVID. You know, when you begin to see that all around you is death, then you understand that although I walk through the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Your faith begins to have a, str a strength that even goes beyond this life. And that's a good thing. For some, they're still grappling with the power of fear and death, and death has become them. It's like they're completely astonished. And this is why we are told very clearly to have faith in Hashem, that our faith should be squarely placed in the Eternal One, and only the Eternal One. Not to put your faith, your trust, in human beings. They will always fail you. Always. They will always let you down. Imagine the students of Rabbi Akiba. All of them let each other down by speaking evil one against the other. And their trust in Hashem was weakened. And thus they were... You know, one of the things that I realize is our walk on this earth is very few. And one thing I learned with Rabbi... David Lairfield, a lot of people who have known him, knew that he was very electronic. What do I mean by electronic? He was like always in a hurry. He appeared to be like quick, quick, quick. And some people took that in a negative way. As that he was, oh, he's very rude, he's very this. And I didn't take it that way. I realized what he was doing was he's trying to serve as many people as he could during the time that he had available to make to maximize his time. And that's something you, you, you realize when you see this man was all about doing the good in, in a time of, of, of limited constraint of time. And the good that he did is insurmountable. You know, one of the things that I mentioned in one of my videos in Spanish was Lairfield never kept copies of any of the certificates of conversions that he did. Never. That I understand. Never kept any of the copies. And he relied on his on the ones that he did the conversion to that would that they would keep a copy of their the conversion papers. It's their responsibility. If all of the people that were converted by Rabbi Lairfield's Bed Din were come to the front I would probably say it's about close to good 10,000, maybe 20,000. I don't know exactly when he was he started. But I can guarantee you that those people that were converted by Rabbi Learfield till this day know that they were converted by him, that his demeanor was really one to help them out and bring them into the fold of Israel. And Rabbi Learfield definitely will be greatly missed in South Florida as being a Dayan who basically cared for the Garams, for the Comrade, the United States, a man that impa at least impacted me in the period of time, even when I went through my divorce. I mean, he was, <laughs> he was clear, no doubt about it, no doubt about it. And I wish many of you would have known him, those who don't know him, because he would have impacted your life as well. I am very grateful to the community of North Miami Beach, for having such a, a, a rabbi that was there for many of you in North Miami Beach. And definitely, whenever you call, as a matter of fact, I still have, believe it or not, I still have a voicemail of him. 
when he returned. And this Rabbi Lerfeld was a very busy man. So returning calls by most rabbis is, is, is not seen. You won't get a call back very quickly from a rabbi who is busy. And yet Rabbi Lerfeld was never the type of person that would not call back. I mean, it was like it had to be something very, very extreme. And this is what you see of a, of a, of a Torah Chacham, a Torah giant. And for me, he will always be in that mindset, uh, a Torah giant. Even though in his humbleness, he says, don't look, up, don't look at me with so, such high regard. I'm a human being. That's the humility, you know. <laughs> um, and those other rabbis in the community know what I'm talking about when I speak about this. So when we look at Lagba Omer, and it's not of coincidence that he just died just prior to, it reminds me of the, the, the great destruction of the, the great leaders of the students of Rabbi Akiba. That what we should learn is to love one another, to care for one another earnestly, honestly, and to respect each other's differences of opinions and be able to say, you know what? We are Kalal Israel, and we should take care of us, one another, in unity, in Achdut. Despite difference of opinion within Halacha and Torah, we are one nation, one people, with one Torah, and that Torah is our constitution. It's not the constitution of other countries. Our inheritance is Israel. Our inheritance is the Torah. God has not given that to any other nation in the world. Not even Esau. Not even uh, Ishmaelites. Only Israel. Only the people of Israel. And so when you embrace the Torah and you embrace the unity of the children of Israel, you may not like everyone that's in the nation. You may have some issues with them. It's like I always say, sometimes my wine is bitter, but it's my wine. It's my people. The very expression of Ruth comes to reality. When you hear the word, my people, your God shall be my God, whatever happens to you. May it happen to me as well, and this becomes, as it were, the very, the, the very song, the very poem, the very strength of the children of Israel. And it's my prayer, and may it be your prayer as well, that soon all of Israel will be united as a people under God, a people whose constitution is not what the Knesset decides, but what the Torah tells us that we should decide. And bring upon the nation of Israel the monarchy and the hope and prayer that the restoration of the Davidic dynasty take place in our days. It can happen. Reset the nation of Israel towards the Davidic monarchy would be a beautiful thing. It would be a beautiful gift that God would give the children of Israel, those who hope and dream in the coming and the realization of all that was promised by our forefathers in our days. And it can happen. Now, lo and behold, I got a real question in the alarm of some of my predictors that, uh, that the Messiah will be here by Shashan. I'm not one putting in the baby because the tells us not to. And there's some stern warning for those who, who decides to predict day and time and hour of the coming of the Mashiach with a very negative result. There's even a curse. And so I hope that happens, but in the back of my, my mind, I know it's, it's in God's times, not in the person predicting the time because they think, here's the signs and here's the time and he's going to happen. It's got to happen. If it doesn't happen, we've heard that before. The actual return of the ones are there now. You got to get built. Build the temple. You got to build. You got to re-strengthen or recreate the Sanhedrin. Uh, you don't like the Sanhedrin that's there now. Well, you know what? It's time to work on that one and create one that will work. So there's a lot of work for the children of Israel to get involved in today. And obviously, there is the return of all Jews back to the land, which will cause some major other problems. But as we saw in the previous administration, how God can create miracles by even moving. Uh, the 
in declaring the city of Jerusalem as the eternal capital of uh, of Israel, and that happened for the first time in history. It was completely a biblical event. God can do it again, my friends, and God could even do greater things if we just ply ourselves to do what God wants. That's why I put in one of my videos, I'm in favor of LGBT, and everybody said, what? LGBT? You mean your favorite? No, I didn't say that. I said, I'm in favor of LGBT, an acronym. Let's get back. I like that. That way we have a response to those who are pro-LGBT. Our response to LGBT is, yeah, I'm in favor of LGBT too, but it's a different kind. It's getting, let's get back to our values. And when we do that, we get back into some sense of normalcy, not abnormalcy. We've been living our a life, a world that is completely gone haywire to the wrong direction. Instead of looking for God, they're looking for appeasement and pleasement and pleasures that will soothe their mind and their conscience, but does not make right in this world and in the world to come. So Lagba Omer and the plague that happened, when we look at it properly, it was all for good. Can't understand that necessarily, but it's all gam zula tova. It's all for good for humanity. It's all good for even us Jews. Eventually, it's all good. Because if we don't learn the lessons of Lagba Omer, if we don't learn the lessons of the pogroms and the persecutions, if we don't learn these things, we're going to end up repeating it. So why not treat each other a little bit better? Like if, in fact, we are the family that we are. We are the mashpacha of Kalal Israel. We are the Bnei Elohim, the children or sons of God. Why don't we treat each other that way? And God will smile from above and give our people what He has wanted to for thousands of years and be happy with us and we happy with Him and we embrace the Torah with that love and that kindness. This is my dream. This is my prayer. And this is my blessing that I pray for all of you watching. That you too may be, you know what, united in that same desire and that same prayer to want to bring the realization of what God has promised us today, now, Akshav, Rabbi Moshe Otero with the Ways of Israel, be part of illuminating other lives to bring them to that light of truth. Amen.